Welcome to the biology section of our practice MCAT questions. In this video, we're going to be going through questions 46 to 50. So first I'll show you guys a question so that you can pause the video and attempt them on your own. Here's question 46, 47, 48, 49, and 50. Now let's go through the questions together. Question 46 is saying bone tissue does not serve which of the following purposes in the human body? So we're talking about bone tissue and the function that it does not serve. So the purpose that it does not serve, it serves three out of these four functions or purposes and then one of these it does not. So blood cell production, does bone tissue have this as part of its functions? Yes, it does. So the bone marrow is a site of blood cell production. So yes, bone tissue does have this purpose. Option B is saying sound transduction. That is also a purpose of bone tissue. So in the ear, we have the three smallest bones, the incus, stapes, and the malleus as well. Incus, malleus, and stapes. Those three bones are responsible for conducting vibrations in the ear. And so they are responsible for sound transduction as well. Option C is mineral storage. And yes, this is also a function of the bone because the bone contains minerals such as potassium and calcium. So this is also a function of bones. And finally, heavy metal and toxin excretion is not a function of bone. Bone tissue may contain some heavy metals, but it's more so a storage purpose, but it does not actually excrete these metals. So any toxin excretion, that's a function for other parts of the body, for example, the kidneys, but not bone tissue. And even if the bone contains heavy metals, it's not responsible for excreting them. That's, once again, a function of a different part of the body. So D is the correct answer here. In question 47, we're asked which of the following is the first line of defense for the immune system of the human body? So the immune system, the part of the body which is responsible for protecting us against pathogens and foreign invasions and anything that can harm us from the outside environment, what is the first line of defense? That would be the first thing that any outside pathogen will encounter and option a is correct that would be the epithelia so there are different types of epithelial ep epithelial tissue and epithelial linings that pathogens will first encounter for example the skin would be the first line of defense against any invasion of our body so the first line of defense that the immune system has would be the skin which is type of an which is a type of epithelial tissue and then there's also epithelial linings in our respiratory tract and our digestive tract those are the things that pathogens would first encounter and that's where we would have our first immune response and then after that then we get to other places inside our body like for example our actual digestive system our blood system or lymphatic system all of that comes after there's an encounter with an epithelial type of tissue so a is correct question 48 is a long one so let's just work through it step by step. It's saying that a plasmid contains genes for ampicillin and canamycin resistance. A restriction endonucleus is used to cut the plasmid within the AMP R gene before ligating in a gene fragment that shares the same restriction sites cut by the endonucleus, encoding green fluorescent protein or GFP. The product from this plasmid construct experiment is then transformed into competent bacteria which are allowed to grow and replicate over a period of time. These bacteria are then smeared on agar plates containing canamycin. The next day, several bacterial colonies are observed to grow on the plates. Viewed under a fluorescent microscope, fluorescence is observed. Which of the following is true about all of the, all of the bacterial colonies that are growing on the agar plates? So let's just read through that again and understood, understand what happens. So we have a plasmid and this plasmid contains genes for ampicillin and canamycin resistance, all right? So we have a plasmid, which means we have a set of GNA, a set of DNA, sorry, which contains two specific genes, ampicillin and canamycin resistance. And then what we usually do with plasmids is we transform them, meaning we have them uptaken by bacteria. The bacteria then use this plasmid as their own and they integrate it into their own genome and then they can express the genes that are in that plasmid. And so if we give a bacterial colony a gene which has resistance for ampicillin and canamycin, so these antibiotics, then they'll be resistant to these antibiotics and then these 
bacteria should be able to survive if we grow them on a media that contains ampicillin or acanamycin. So we have this plasmid, but first of all, what we do is we use a restriction endonucleus to cut where we have the amp R gene. And that would be the ampicillin resistance gene, which means we're cutting out the ampicillin resistance gene. And then we added the GFP gene, which is gluten fluorescence protein. And so if a bacteria expresses a pro this protein, it's gonna produce a protein that fluoresces and we should see a fluorescence product under a fluorescence microscope. So what we did is we took a plasmid, which is resistant to, ampic resistant to ampicillin and canamycin. We replaced where it was resistant to ampicillin with GFP. And then we you know, gave it to some competent bacteria. They were allowed to grow and replicate. And then we put them on agar plates containing canamycin. And then colonies were observed. And then fluorescence was also observed. We're asked which of the following is true about all of the bacterial colonies. So this is the keyword here, all of them. So if we see that they're growing on canamycin media, that means that these bacteria must have uptaken the plasmid, which contains the canamycin resistance gene. That is why they're able to grow. Otherwise, they would have died because of canamycin. So they do have canamycin resistance. So that is something we can say about all of them. So option C would be correct here. Something that we can definitively say about all the bacterial colonies that exist on this canamycin medium is that they are resistant to canamycin. Otherwise, they would not have even grown. We can't say option A, that they all contain the plasmid con construct containing GFP, because what we did is we took a plasmid and we tried to alter it so that we get rid of the ampicillin resistance gene and add in GFP, but we used a uh, restriction endonucleus and you know we tried to add in a new gene, but it's possible that we might still have some of the original plasmid left over in whatever like vial that we carry this plasmid in. And so when we give this plasmid to our bacterial colony, some of them might have uptaken the original plasmid. So we can't definitively say that they all contain the plasmid construct, which contains GFP. Some of them might have taken up the original one, and that will still allow them to be resistant to canamycin. Option B is saying they all exhibit ampicillin resistance. That is not true because the whole point of what we did before to that plasmid is cut out the ampicillin resistance gene and replace it with GFP. So more likely they are not resistant to ampicillin because if they are fluorescing that means that they uptook the plasmid which gives them GFP instead of ampicillin resistance. And option D is saying none of the above are true. No, we can at least say that C is true. They're all resistant to canamycin and we could say this about every single colony that is growing on a canamycin medium medium. So that's the correct and most backed up by evidence answer that we have for question 48. In question 49, we're asked which of the following is appropriate, is the approximate size range for viruses. So we want to know the size range approximately for viruses. So this question kind of requires you to actually be able to place the size range of different, different things that we talk about in biology and then also a bit chemistry as well. So something like 20 to 500 picometers would be way too small because if you fully understand meters and size and relativity, then you should know that picometers is a very, very small range. It's about 10 to the negative 12, 10 to the negative 12 meters, which means that we are talking on a very small scale. Usually this is the scale which quantum mechanics happens. So we're talking about like the size of atoms. So this is far too small for anything, far too small for anything, really. We're just talking about atoms, so we can't talk about anything bigger than an atom, really. Then we could maybe talk about some molecules, but that's way too small for anything that's even, even though we consider like viruses to be at a very small level, this is definitely way too small even on that scale. So viruses are too big to be at this scale. Option B is also too small as well. Angstroms. Like often you will hear angstroms being used as a length for determining the distance between atoms. So for example, like a carbon hydrogen bond or carbon carbon bond, we might use angstroms as a measurement to say the distance between these two atoms. So the bond length, but so that should also tell you that if we're talking about the length between atoms, that is also far too small of a measurement. Option C would be correct. Sorry about that. Option C 
nanometers, yes, that one makes sense. So globular proteins, they can reach sizes up to, for example, one nanometers. So if a protein can be at least a nanometer, like if that is one range which they can enter into, and you know that viruses contain proteins, for example, like an RNA transcriptase, then you should know that the virus definitely has to be at least bigger than this. So 20 to 500 nanometers, yes, we can reasonably say that this is an approximate size range for viruses. This is fine. Option D, now that would be entering too big a territory. Micrometers, no. That would be more so along, along the size of where bacteria can be found. And if you use like a visible microscope, they can look down to about one micrometer and visible microscopes can see bacteria, but they're not able to see viruses. This is something that you should know if you have any experience with a visible microscope, which you should from biology courses. And so you should know that this is too large a range for viruses to be found in. So C is the best answer. And now in question 50, it says a strain of bacteria is transformed with a gene encoding for telomerase. This is most likely going to have which of the following effects on the bacterial strain. So we take a bacteria strain, transform it, and give it telomerase. What is the effect now? So telomerase will grow the telomeres at the end of chromosomes, which protects them when you have division due to mitosis. And therefore, if something has telomerase, you can expect it to have a longer life overall because there's less damage to the chromosomes. However, bacteria, their DNA exists in a circular form. They don't have chromosomes with telomeres at the end. Their DNA is circular, and therefore there is really no end to their DNA, and telomeres are, exist at the end of chromosomes, but that means that bacteria with their circular genome and their circular DNA, they don't have telomeres. Therefore, adding telomerase would have no effect. So D is the correct answer here. And the other options are irrelevant because we're talking about bacteria. That's it for the questions in this video. If you enjoyed what you saw, make sure to check out our course on teachable.com. The link is in the description below. In that course, we go through a lot more questions and go through all the different answer options, explaining why each one is correct or incorrect. And other than that, make sure to subscribe to this channel in order to stay up to date with the videos that we post here. That's it for this video.